Well, welcome to the British Library and to our US politics uh, live stream discussion. My name is Cara, and during the next hour, our guests, former members of Congress, Donna Edwards and Charles Bustani, um, will discuss their political careers and take questions from our audience uh, on topics related to contemporary US politics. This is a really wonderful opportunity for all of us to gain a first-hand insight into contemporary US politics, um, the current political climate, and to find out how Congress uh, and Washington really works through, uh, through the, the wonderful lived experiences of those who've been there. Um, and obviously, I'm particularly excited that we have a bipartisan group uh, today, so we'll, we'll be able to hear from both sides of the aisle. Uh, we'll have opportunities for questions from the audience here at the British Library, um, but if uh, you're watching us online and would like to join in, uh, please do uh, tweet your questions to us, hashtag Congress to Campus, um, and my colleague will wave his hand wildly and I, <laughs> we will take your question. Um, so thank you so much uh, for coming. So I'm going to uh, start off by inviting our guests to just introduce themselves and also maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to Congress, kind of what took you. You obviously both had interesting careers beforehand. What took you to Congress? I'm going to ask Donna to start us off. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you all um, pardon my what I describe as my Stonehenge voice. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here with you. I'm Donna Edwards. I was a member of Congress for five terms from 2008 until 2017. And I describe myself sometimes as an accidental congresswoman. Uh, I lived in my congressional district, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., in the state of Maryland. And I was very active in my community. And then finally just got really annoyed with my uh, congressman and decided after asking a whole bunch of other people to run against him and nobody saying yes because he had been in Congress for, I think, at that time, seven terms. And then I said, well, if nobody else is going to do it, I'll do it. And so I signed up. I wrote a check for $100 because that's what it cost in my state to run for Congress. And I didn't tell anybody about it all weekend long, including my family. <laughs> uh, but then I decided that in order to be a congresswoman, I would actually have to start telling people. Uh, and so I ran. The very first time I ran, I actually lost that election. But because it was very close, I decided I would run again. And the second election, I won by 23 percentage points, having lost by two points uh, before. And um, I served on a number of com committees. We'll be able to talk about that later on. But I will say that holding elective office and being in Congress was one of the greatest privileges that I've had. And you know, the ability to make a difference in people's lives in big ways and small ways. And so I'm excited to be here with you today. And you all can ask us anything at all. And I'd uh, love to take your questions. Thank you very much, Cara. Well, my name is Charles Bustani, and I represented a district in Louisiana uh, famous for hurricanes. And um, I made a decision to run for Congress um, at a time when I was very busy, married with two children, um, both in high school at the time, and I was a practicing cardiovascular surgeon. I did open heart surgery, lung cancer surgery, had never really been in politics before, but I was interested in it, and I followed it. And Around the time that I made the decision, the news, this was in 2003, 2004, uh, actually late 2003, before the 2004 election, I was very disturbed by um, our, our drift with the Iraq war and the problems that we were seeing in Iraq and the mistakes that were being made. Uh, two young men who were in high school with my son had been killed in Iraq. Uh, it, and it really disturbed a lot of individuals, families in our community. Um, and then being a doctor, I saw all the problems with the healthcare system. And I had, a, I had a great deal of difficulty sleeping one night thinking about all this. It was sort of floating around in my head. And I got up very, very early in the morning and I went to the kitchen, got myself a cup of coffee. And, and as I started looking at the newspaper, I was getting angrier and angrier about what was going on and dissatisfied with the fact that I'm down here in Louisiana, all these things are going on, and I want to do something about it. So right then and there, I made a decision that I was going to run for Congress. And um, I, uh, my wife later came into the kitchen wanting to know why I was up so early, and I said, well, honey, we need to talk. And her face 
just went completely blank. She got very pale. I could see fear, like, what's coming? Uh, oh, my God, he's got cancer. He's leaving me. There's some bad <laughs> news here. And when I said, uh, I'm going to run for Congress, and she just stared at me, and then her face got beet red, and then we had a three-day argument. And finally, she said, I've known you since we were started dating in, con in college, and uh, you have a very hard head. Um, and once you make up your mind, you won't back down. So go ahead, run for Congress. I think this is a terrible mistake, and when you get 15% of the vote and get totally humiliated, I don't want to ever hear about this again. Get it out of your system. <laughs> so I, did, you know, I was excited, being the optimist that I am, and then I realized, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never run a campaign before, and I realized, okay, well, I need to hire some people who know what they're doing, which means you've got to raise money. And so then I started working on that and ultimately put a very good campaign together, um, stumbling through it for the most part, and ultimately beat uh, three very well-established politicians uh, through the primary and the general election. Nobody thought I could win, but we worked very, very hard to gain the trust of constituents one after another. And just outworked everybody, and uh, and I won with 50, I won 55-45 in that first election. I was the first Republican ever to ever elected to represent that district, but I was able to bridge the the, the trust gap by making personal contact with people, and continued to do that and continued to win elections. The last one uh, in my constituency, I won with 80 percent of the vote. Then I got greedy and ran for the U.S. Senate uh, with an open house, uh, an open seat, and I ended up losing that race uh, by a small margin. But politics had shifted in, in my state, um, and the Republican Party went much harder to the right in the state, which uh, I'm more of a, a centrist uh, Republican, and, and so ultimately lost that. And so here I am as a former member of Congress. <laughs> and so as Donna said, all questions uh, are you know, on the table. Well, thank you both very much um, for those introductions. I thought I would just get us rolling. Um, and I was wondering, what surprised you most when you first got to Congress? What do you think you, know, you misunderstood looking from the outside in? What, what was the most surprising thing? I, I would say, um, you know, I think a lot of members of Congress work really hard, but I was actually surprised at how many members really were not sort of readers and students and um, that that shocked me. I mean, I because I I would take everything home and you know and read it and study and um, you know when we we did the uh, health care bill when I first came into Congress and uh, I was I was one of those who took that couple of thousand pages home and I read every single page and I'm a lawyer by training. I went to law school and was licensed and. I put tabs on the side and wrote notes and uh, flipped through every single page of it. And I, was, I thought everybody did that, and it turned out that wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. I think that, that also surprised me because my background as a doctor, you know, you had to study hard to become a doctor. And then I felt this strong sense of obligation that if I'm going to vote on something, I need to know what it is. And I realized a lot of, a lot of folks had a very shallow knowledge of what what was actually actually being voted on. But you know, it was funny, I remember when I first started, because I'd, I'd never been in politics, so I, I was very fortunate to hire a, a very experienced chief of staff who helped me build the right kind of staff around me to be effective. And he told me on the very first day, he said, keep this in mind, Congress is like high school. It's, it's like a big high school campus and there are cliques and people gravitate into these little cliques and they, they sort of, you get this little herd mentality here and there. And it was a very, I thought a very, very accurate uh, description of how Congress yeah. sort of operates internally. And, um, and uh, so by kind of keeping that in mind, it helped me to un understand some of the politics that play out internally in the halls of Congress. Who's talking to whom? Uh, why are they making decisions the way they do? Why? This little group is deciding they're going to um, vote against the leadership, even though it's in the same party, those kinds of things. But then it also forced me to realize that people come from very different backgrounds. They represent different types of constituencies. And it's important to understand that, too, to, to really get to know the people you're working with. Well, thank you. So do we have uh, any first questions? 
from the floor. So for those who are in here, we my, my colleagues have our roving mics, so don't be shy. Yeah, don't be shy. This is, a, this is an opportunity to learn. Okay, now. lady at the front. Given that you were not previously um, a politician, do you think there's a specific thing that constituents like to hear from you to ga gain their trust? Yes. I think uh, I mentioned earlier that I was the first Republican to ever win that office. And all the local politicians told me, oh, we like you. We know you're a respected doctor, but wrong party. But I kept working hard uh, reaching out to people across. You know, I, I had a rule, basically. I'm not going to let anybody that I pass not... You know, I, I'm not going to ignore them. I'm going to walk up to them. I'm going to shake their hand. I'm going to ask them for their support, and I'll tell them about me. And so oftentimes when we were on the road, we would just stop in you know, a small grocery or a filling station, and I would do that. While my uh, person with me was filling up the car or whatever, I would go and talk to everybody. Half the time I ran into people who were not even uh, constituents. They were from different states. <laughs> but, um, but it was a great exercise. And when you do that, you start to really meet people and understand what motivates them. And by doing that, I was able to circumvent the political establishment and to gain such support that once I got through the first round and went into the second round, I was actually, actually able to convert many local democratic um, pol uh, political ho office holders uh, in my corner because I developed this trust. Being a doctor helped as well. Physicians have a certain level of trust. It's, uh, it was relatively unusual back then for physicians to run for political office, and so that helped me as well. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I'm not a physician. I'm a lawyer, and there are a lot of lawyers in, in Congress, <laughs> but I had never been in, in politics before, and I actually thought that that was an advantage mm -hmm. um, because I ran against an incumbent member of my own party, which is just not done, and um, so the the party apparatus was completely opposed to me. And I did what Charles did was I went around that and went out where people live in their neighborhoods, communities, or grocery stores at the gas station, uh, any place that I could find people, shake their hands, introduce myself, um, ask them what's important to them. I also shared my story and my history because although I'm a, a lawyer and have obviously had an opportunity that a lot of people don't have. I started from very humble beginnings. And at the time I had been raising my son, who's now 30, but at the time he was in high school, as a, a, a single mother uh, raising this young man. And I was able to share that uh, with people and identify with them in their own lives. And I think when you're in politics, when you open up your own life and your life story, yeah. people just see you as a regular person. and. Uh, it endears you uh, to them. And so when I won that second election, it was because I really connected with, with people and then thereafter won my elections with uh, almost 90% of the vote in my, uh, my district. Um, but uh, I think it's really about those personal connections. Um, so you've obviously done quite a couple of terms over the years. How did you guys, how are you managing to not burn out and keep going in terms of just not stopping after one or two terms? Well, what was you know, keeping you going? Oh, for <laughs> me, it was the work. I mean, for me, it was, you know, the ability to get in and to get some things done. Uh, when I ran, I think like Charles, um, a huge part of, my message was around the Iraq war and around the foolishness of going into Iraq and I actually ran against a gentleman who supported the Iraq war and it turns out that our constituencies, our constituents really did not. Uh, I ran on an, an agenda of bringing health care uh, to people. I shared with them that there was a time when I didn't have health insurance. You all don't um, sort of have that system here. And I found myself in an emergency room without any health insurance. And I ended up with thousands of dollars of health care bills that almost bankrupt me. And I wanted to go in and fix that, uh, that system. And so it's doing those things that really kept me going. And I went on a foolhardy adventure, too. I ran for the United States Senate in an open seat 
That's what we shared, Charles, <laughs> and, uh, and lost that election, yeah. but continue to figure out ways like this to, uh, to continue to serve the public. When I was in medicine um, and would perform open heart operations and helping a poor person who was scared to death of what they were facing and their families were afraid, um, and then to help them through that and see them come back to the, my office six weeks later, feeling good, feeling much better than they did. It, it always inspired me that I was helping people. And my time in politics, and I served six terms, 12 years, uh, from 2005 to 2017. And the ability to help people, you know, on a bigger scale, always gave me enthusiasm. I woke up in the morning, every day I was in Congress, enthusiastic about the work I had to do. And even when I was tired uh, in the evenings, you know, ready to get, go back at it. In my first year in office, and I was very inexperienced, I was having to learn the ropes, how Congress works, how to be, a, you know, how to even be in politics other than just being somebody who related pretty well to people. Um, my, my area was hit by two major hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. And I traveled around the district. I was getting maybe two or three hours of sleep a night for weeks on end because so many people had lost their homes, they had lost their businesses, and they had nowhere to turn because it, there was a lot of poverty in my district. And the fact that I, I was able to help so many of them made a difference. I'll never forget, um, we were driving in a very rural part of my, area, my district which had been hit very badly by hurricanes. And I saw this man, he was elderly, and he was carrying all this stuff across the front yard of a house and the yard was all mud where a nice beautiful lawn had probably been before and he was slogging through the mud and I made uh, my staff person stop and I, I walked across the mud to help him carry this stuff to the front and we started talking and I said do you mind would you show me what's what happened to your house and he said uh, this is my daughter's house I'm helping her because she had to go to work and um, the kids had to be sent to a different school outside of our area uh, to continue their schooling. He took me in there, and this was an area that had been terribly flooded. Uh, there was a, a large appli kitchen appliance that had been th completely thrown across the room and wedged under a counter. There was this much mud in the house. And we walked through that house, and it smelled awful. It was just a terrible scene. And I'll never forget this, walked in the living room, and the only thing that was kind of normal was a picture of the family sitting on a, on a, right above the fireplace. It was splattered with mud, but it was still there. And it just struck me, I said, and I pointed, I, I, I told the gentleman, I said, that is symbolic of who we are. Your family, and in that picture, it, it shows that they withstood this and they will be back in this house, and this house will be cleaned. And that kind of stuff just motivated me. I, I could go hours on end uh, with fatigue, and until I would get home, that's when I'd realize how tired I was, because when I was helping people, it didn't stop. You wanted to do that. It, it gave you this strong sense of mission. Well, let's just pick up on that. What, um, obviously, there's a balance between needing to do your job in Congress and needing to be at home in your constituency, how did you how did you balance that? How did you make sure that you know that you that those both parts of that job were sort of you felt you were doing them effectively? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, and you have your congressional staff mm. on Capitol Hill, and then each of us have a, a staff to handle day to day problems in the district. I was very fortunate because my district was very close to Capitol Hill. And so I got to just live in my district at home all the time and uh, spent time going to, uh, to schools to visit school children and uh, places where seniors gathered and um, all across the district visiting with businesses. And um, I did find that having a congressional district that was close to Washington, D.C. meant that I almost never took off. In fact, I actually didn't have a vacation. I didn't take a vacation. I didn't realize this until after I got out of Congress um, for the entire time that I was, uh, was serving. I don't think that's a good way to balance things. <laughs> but I didn't really notice it, to be quite honest with you. And there are things that you see when you're on the ground in your district, as Charles just described, 
that remind you of why it is that you're serving Congress. You're not serving to introduce some bill that somebody else introduced that's never going to get passed. You're there to serve the people in the best way possible, um, you know, in their daily experiences. And most people are concerned about just a couple of things, where their children are being educated, uh, how they're earning a living, what their health care is, and they want you to make sure that their children's lives are better than theirs. I mean, that really is very fundamental, and I'm sure that's true here in the UK as well. And I think when you're a member of Congress and you can just sort of stay focused on that, then you don't pay attention to all the distractions. My constituency was uh, quite a bit of distance from Washington. I had to take two, two airplane flights, and I, I would fly from Washington to Atlanta, sit in the airport for a few hours, and then take another flight down to my hometown in Louisiana. So if everything went well with the flights, it was about a six-hour you know, uh, period of time, six or seven hours. If it didn't go well, it, it, I, one time it took me 23 hours to get home. Um, the most important th uh, thing, uh, in fact, when I was in, this, in the, the district with constituents, I was always even busier than Washington, so I never had time. Like Donna, I, I don't think I took much time off. It was a seven-day-a-week uh, situation, uh, oftentimes flying back and going straight to an event before you even go home, that kind of thing. But uh, the most important thing uh, in all of that, because the schedule is so busy, is to have a scheduler who is who understands the district, sympathetic to your constituents' needs, and know that your constituents come first. So the way we, if I was in Washington, the, the top priority obviously was to cast votes in, on the House floor or in committee. But if I had constituents who had flown up, even if I was in a committee meeting, I would step out to say hello I might have staff address the, the major concern and spend more time with them, but I always took the effort to step out and ask them how they were doing. You know, if I knew some family members or friends of theirs, I'd try to make a personal connection. Um, it's a very demanding schedule, and it leaves no time for yourself because what little time you have, you want to give to your family. Um, you know, we, we would try to block out Sunday morning, for instance, or at least uh, one meal on Sunday when I was back home to spend with family. The rest of the time I was going to events and um, it's quite a busy schedule. And in Washington, for any any 30 minute block of time, you may have six different demands on your time. Um, and you know you always have somebody leading you, you know, leaving something earlier than you want to, to go to something you have to go to. And then before you finish that, you're off again to something else. It's a, a very hectic schedule. And that was hard for me because as a surgeon, it was always, okay, I'm going to see this patient. I've got this operation. Then I have got uh, my rounds to make on the hospital patients. Then another surgery. It was a very linear schedule. It was nothing like that in Congress. Okay, wonderful. Any more questions from the audience? Just in front. Having seen things from the inside, what would you say is the biggest failing in the current American political system? For example, in the UK, people often point out the shortcomings of the first-past-the-post system. What would you say needs fixing or changing in America, or could be changed, if anything? Well, I think we probably share this, but I, I think that the, um, the biggest problem, I think, that contributes both to inaction and to uh, conflict is, um, is structural. Uh, I, it's the fact that members of Congress, especially if you're in a competitive district, you have to spend between 35, 40, 50 hours a week on a telephone calling people to raise money to campaign. And that begins almost from the moment that you're elected. And so if you can imagine a work week, if you know 40, 50 hours are spent what we describe as dialing for dollars, calling donors to ask them to give you money. Doesn't leave a lot of waking hours to do other things, to get to know your colleagues, uh, to, uh, to do your homework, um, to pay attention to constituents the way that you need. And so I think that we have to change the money system uh, and, and allow members of Congress to come in and really focus on being members. I fully agree with that, so I won't repeat what Donna said, but 
Um, but it is, that is an absolute fundamental flaw in the way our system is set up now. But it's made worse by the fact that um, the current American law allows for these outside groups that could be single issue groups or maybe just a few core issues to put together an organization and raise unlimited amounts of money that they use to put pressure on members of Congress uh, not to deviate from those issues. And it, it's a very polarizing atmosphere. Uh, they drive division. They raise a lot more money than Donna or I can raise in, for our own campaigns because we have limitations put upon us on, on that. So you're limited in your ability to counter it. And if you couple that, that type of scenario with that money and those influence groups, with the fact that social media, a 24-7 news cycle, um, uh, gives you no space, there's no political space to build relationships and to work on some issues in a more substantive way. Right now, it's, it's, everything has to be in, you know, put into a tweet or even a bumper sticker type of slogan. So the opportunity to do the substantive work to solve the problems that everyday families are, are dealing with uh, around the kitchen table and healthcare and education, um, you know, even foreign policy issues that affect communities, those things don't get addressed in a thorough manner in which they should be addressed because all the pressures are placed on you politically and there's just no political space to, to actually work on those things. Mm -hmm. Everybody Hi, I would like to ask you about your personal experience with partisan polarization and if how you deal with, with that when it comes to complications about voting on something within Congress. I mean, it's a real, it is a real issue. I think one of the structural problems that we haven't had a, had a chance to talk about is um, when we do apportionment, you know, we count the number of people, divide up the congressional districts, and then those districts are drawn. Many of them are highly gerrymandered. They're highly drawn so that there's, you know, a concentration of Democrats or Republicans in one of the other districts. And because of that, there are very few districts where, you know, you find that happy middle uh, so that you can have ground for compromise. And so that's something that we have to work on. And I would, I would add to that. I recall a circumstance where I was working on our science committee overseeing um, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration funding. That should not be a partisan issue, funding space. But it became a partisan issue. And what I found is that when I stepped aside and made a phone call to the chairman and said, let's sit down, just the two of us, and talk this through. And we sat down with some coffee and on a napkin highlighted the things that we each wanted to see. Then we went back and, got, and wrote a bill, and then we passed it unanimously. And then it went to the floor and it passed unanimously. That should have happened in the beginning, um, but it did happen because the two of us had a relationship and we were able to step back away from the cameras and sit down and really do the work. One time I, um, we were trying to get uh, this a bank called the Export-Import Bank uh, reauthorized and, and, and set up to operate. And what that bank did was it provided help for small businesses who were trying to export and it provided financing and, you know, some insurance and so forth. Um, it became a very hot-button political issue because there were outside conservative groups that wanted to cut government and cut government spending and get rid of programs. So they targeted this program, even though it wasn't really directly funded by the government. It was a self-sustaining entity, and every country in the world uses it uh, to great advantage. Even Ronald Reagan, you know, the, the you know father of, of modern conservatism uh, with the Republican Party, used it extensively to help promote American business interests around the world. Well. The chairman of the committee who wanted to, who, who was entrusted with the reauthorization of this bank, wanted to get rid of it for political reasons. He wouldn't even have a conversation, and a fellow Republican wouldn't even have a conversation with me wow. on why it's so important. And I had 160 small businesses that depended on this in South Louisiana, and they were, they were gonna be threatened by an, an inoperative bank like this. And so I tried to have a conversation with him 
it was all for naught. Uh, we knew that there were enough Republicans and Democrats combined that if we took it to the floor for a vote, it would pass easily. But the chairman was blocking it, and the Republican leadership didn't want to do anything about it. And so we knew there was a, there was a kind of a, a, a little used tool to bypass the congressional process and force a floor, a floor vote. Uh, and if we could do that, we could win. So the key was we had to find enough Republicans who were going to have the courage to go sign this what's called a discharge petition to force the bill for a vote. And that, that is never done by you know, people in the majority going against their own party leadership. So I decided, among a few others, that we were going to do that. And, and our Democratic friends welcomed it. And we went down publicly to the House floor and each one by one signed that book. And we got to the necessary 218 votes, which required about 30 or so of us on the Republican side to do this. And we forced that vote and we won. Uh, there were some arch conservative fellow Republicans who came to me and, and called me a few names on the House floor, called me a traitor. And, I, and what angered me more than anything was the fact that they didn't even understand how the bank worked. And I had done my homework, and the sad thing is the arguments about this is how this works, this is why it's necessary, they weren't willing to even listen to those kinds of answers. And that's a problem. Uh, but it was always, it always took a level of courage to do those kinds of things and then they'd be able to take the heat. Sometimes you had to vote against what most of your constituents wanted because it was the right thing to do for the, for the country and ultimately for your constituency. Um, but you took a lot of heat for that. And those things, you know, it requires a level of courage to do it. And did those, um, those things ever kind of really come back in primaries? Did you find yourself... Oh, repeatedly. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, yeah, what, no, well, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, I had them come back repeatedly on television ads, uh, yeah. and, but then as you start to accrue more and more of these, it, it gets to be a problem. That's, that's ultimately one of the factors that contributed to my loss in a Senate race, even though I think if I'd have run for re-election in my, my congressional district, I would have won again. But in the Senate race, it was just too much to overcome. Well, I was, I was just reminded that um, one of the tough votes that we took was um, following as the um, that great recession was taking place and the entire world economy was uh, caught up in it. We had to pass emergency legislation under the uh, George Bush um, presidency uh, to really save our economy. And to this day, Charles can probably go out, and I do, some people actually still think I'm in Congress, but to this day, people will walk up to me and ask me about that TARP vote yeah, <laughs> because they still yeah. remember it. And that was one of those things where it was $700 billion and that's a lot of money. And a lot of people didn't want to spend that money, but it was absolutely necessary to do or the entire economy would have collapsed. And I, I believe that, I believe those arguments, um, but it is one of those votes that cost you politically. I voted for that too, and I think it was one of the most important votes I ever took. Yeah. And 80% of my constituents were vocally against yes. it. And I heard about it in every, every subsequent election. But, you know, people like Donna and myself and others who uh, were doing our homework and trying to understand what was really happening uh, rather than just the politics of the day, you know, we took those hard votes. And I, I'm convinced it helps. It helped our country from going into a yeah. depression. Thank you, gentleman in the middle. Um, if both of you are entering politics today, running for office for the first time today, how do you imagine that might be different from when you did first enter politics? Sort of maybe your running points or alignments. I, I mean, I don't, and I'm not sure how much it would be sort of substantively on policy, but I will say the environment has changed. Um, when I ran for Congress, it was at really at the beginning of the use of social media uh, in campaigns. And I would say now that in terms of spending resources to run a campaign, far more emphasis would have to be placed on 
figuring out ways to reach um, potential voters uh, through social media. And, you know, voters now are so, um, uh, so segregated into small groups, groups that you can reach on Facebook in this way or Twitter in another way or Snapchat and Instagram. And I think that makes it more complicated. It also makes your message as a candidate, I think, more complex as well, because it is tough to drill down a complicated policy issue into 280 words or um, something that, you know, where people read a paragraph on Facebook. And it really does our politics, I think, a great disservice to try to drill everything down into such a narrow cast. And so I think that that environment changes the way that one would think about running a co political campaign today. Right. Uh, Donna's absolutely correct. Uh, with the pro proliferation of social media and all the different avenues to communicate, it gives you an, an opportunity to directly communicate to your constituency, but it also, uh, because of all the other things going on, other groups and other entities can do the same and reach the same constituency. So it, it's created a much more anarchic uh, campaign environment. It used to be conventionally, uh, you would run your television ads, you'd send your direct mail to reach out to constituents um, and, and do town hall meetings, that kind of thing. And as a candidate, you could control the message coming from your campaign. Now, because of all the money uh, combined with all these, you know, these forms of communication, you no longer can truly control uh, your campaign. And so it becomes a race to see whether you can you know, present the image in the, the, the platform that you want to project or somebody's going to define you from the outside. That's the big challenge. What has not changed is you're still trying to win the trust of your constituency. It's just a much more complicated environment in which to do that. Yeah, and I would say on that trust element, I mean, it, you know, there's so much distrust of politics and politicians these days. And uh, I think it's going to, it takes some special people uh, to try to restore that and restore the value of public service. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of energy that's spent, at least in the United States, by outside groups sort of banging on uh, Congress and on government all the time. And the net result of that is that uh, people have lost the confidence in their public institutions to be able to solve big problems. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the challenges, I think, for your generation is to think about politics in a different kind of way, to begin to restore that kind of trust mm -hmm. in our institutions and the people who want to serve. So if you want to run uh, to become an MP here, and I, look, you're here because you're, you're interested in politics, you're eager to learn, and you're probably here as well because you care. You want to do something. You believe that public service is something good. Uh, even at my age and having done this, uh, I still think it's, it's one of the most noble things a person can do. Um, so I hope you do it. And you do learn a lot about yourself when you do it. Uh, be authentic. Care about people. Uh, learn the issues. And don't be afraid to express what you believe. And I think, um, you know, you can build trust. But your generation is going to have a big task ahead in rebuilding that trust, as Donna has said, because we have seen uh, the trust level in our democracies completely eroded, you know, whether it's here in the U.K., uh, the U.S. In the U.S., nobody respects uh, expertise anymore. Uh, for the most part, they, they denigrate it. Um, Everything has, has become, you know, reduced to slogans and, you know, name calling as opposed to let's talk about real substantive issues and problem solving. So I, I'm glad you're here and I hope, I hope you know, your generation can step up and do some good things to restore that trust in the institutions. Um, I found it quite interesting how you mentioned one of the challenges within campaigns now is stopping people from lab uh, stopping people from labeling you from the outside, um, and obviously labeling people is something that Trump's quite good at. 
So considering that, do you think anybody could run a successful campaign against Trump in 2020? <laughs> Well, I think on the Republican side, it's going to be very, at least as of today, it will be very difficult for anybody to challenge him because he is, he has kept the same level of support in, in the core Republican group uh, that existed before, um, uh, well, that he had when he started. And so, it, I, I, you know, the conventional wisdom in Washington now and, and among many who watch this do not believe he will have a legitimate primary challenger. Now, on the Democratic <coughs> side of the aisle, and Donna can speak more authoritatively on this than I can, but, I mean, there are a lot of people lining up to run against him, and I think there is a possibility, uh, depending on a number of factors, that a Democrat could beat him in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the election. Uh, but a number of things have to happen, and it, you know, it's, this is going to be... This is going to be a very unconventional campaign cycle, and it's going to be quite interesting to watch. But um, as a Republican, uh, I, I don't recognize the, the kind of party that Donald Trump has put together around him. That's not, you know, my, my, my positions are more like uh, uh, the first President Bush, George H.W. Bush, who served in the 80s, who took a more expansive view of a number of these issues, behaved as a gentleman um, with civility, respected both his uh, rivals and his, you know, and his friends, uh, and conducted himself above board. And um, I think we need more of that. You know, in politics, we're going to disagree on issues. But there's a way to do it in a way that's civil, it's polite, uh, it, it <coughs> respects boundaries. And that's what's, go that's what's deteriorated today, and that's what Donald Trump is taking advantage of. Well, I mean, I certainly think that um, the president is beatable but you don't beat a person by being him. And so I think it's going to be really important for um, whichever Democratic uh, candidate emerges um, to display that authenticity and to be smart and to rely on facts and uh, to reach out to the, uh, to the public. I think the argument is there to be made. And when I look at the range of candidates that are already in the field, for one, it's exciting for me because I think there are five women who have, are, have either now announced or are running for president of the United States. I believe that that space for a woman nominee in our party, that that groundwork was laid and opened up because of Hillary Clinton. And um, she took a lot of the arrows uh, as a result, but I think it opens up the field uh, for those women. But I see more talent on the Democratic side um, in terms of the numbers and the diversity of candidates that I have seen in a really long time. People have served in the United States Senate, uh, people who have had other life experience before uh, they, they came to the offices they hold. And I'm absolutely convinced that it's the kind of primary where at the end we will have emerged a really solid contender for President of the United States. And it will be their job to unite the Democratic Party. I mean, there's every opportunity to divide it, but it will be the job of that nominee to unite the party. And I think part of that unification comes because we've engaged in a very spirited primary uh, and that that process is going to lend itself to having somebody who's going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe without going down into the mud uh, with, the, with the president in this upcoming election. I know you've already touched on campaign finance, but given the fact that legislation has failed before, do you feel there is a way to present a bipartisan piece of legislation that will with, withstand what has already happened to the other ones? So long before I came into Congress, I think 20, over 25 years ago, I started working on issues of campaign finance reform for a nonprofit, a non governmental organization. Um, and the very first debate I ever had on national television was against the current majority leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, on <laughs> campaign finance reform. And so it's been a long slog. <laughs> um, but I do think it is possible because I think the public has reached a point right now where they are absolutely sick 
of this system. And on the Democratic side, in the House, when the Democrats took the majority in January, their very first piece of legislation, H.R. 1, that passed in this session of Congress was about campaign finance and ethics reform. And that's a first step, but we need a compliant Senate, which we don't have yet, and we need a president in the White House who's gonna sign it. And so we probably are still a ways away from doing it, but it's not because it's not what the public wants. Yeah, I would agree. The public, uh, public attitudes now have shifted significantly, and I think they are really tired of this, uh, and probably across party lines. Yes. I, I think um, there are still Republicans who, because they see an advantage in the current system, um, that they, you know, they're vested in wanting to protect the current situation, the yeah. status quo. I think the, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is one of them, <coughs> and he's going to he'll draw the line and he controls the agenda. Uh, this potentially could become a campaign issue. I think um, in in 2020. Uh, I hope it does because I, I personally. Uh, based on my level of experience with with elections and what happens, I, I think it's needed it, because uh, the money has really infected the system and it's distorted it terribly. And I think if you had a, an honest conversation, even with many Republicans now who've been through tough elections and have had attack ads coming from, you know, entities where you don't know even, don't even know where the money's coming from, but it's seemingly unlimited. Uh, I think they would, in an honest conversation with you, say, yeah, we've got to do something. The biggest issue that is somewhat of a hurdle is how do you deal with this uh, given our First Amendment situation? Um, but I, I guess you could argue the opposite side of it and say, okay, well, uh, because, you, know, you can't hide behind First Amendment rights to protect all this money because at the same time, you've got a lot of people who are being disenfranchised or being you know, hurt by the fact that their voices aren't being heard in the system. Um, one of the most important things that could happen would be to uh, have full, full disclosure of where the money's coming from. I mean, that would be an interim step, and I don't know why anybody would ever be against that, to be honest with you. Uh, but I, I think there's still people in my party who are against that, and I don't understand it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because many years ago when I had this debate with uh, Senator McConnell, he said, oh, we'd love to just have disclosure. Why can't we just do disclosure? And now here he is. There's actually, there was actually a bill that passed for full disclosure, and he's opposed the bill now for full disclosure. That's how you fast forward uh, 25 years. But I think to, to your point, you know, there have been several of the 2020 candidates on the Democratic side who've come out and said, I'm not going to accept um, political action committee money, and I'm not going to accept independent expenditures that are spent on my behalf. I don't want that to happen. And I think the more candidates who do that kind of thing, then the more likely it is that we're going to end up with somebody in the White House who's willing to sign that kind of legislation. Okay. Live in the do you think that the USA would benefit from a multi-party system instead of the dominant two-party system that they have currently? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I don't. And it, it's interesting because, you know, there's been this talk of um, uh, one kid, Howard, Howard Schultz, who owns mm -hmm. Starbucks, or the founder of Starbucks, um, is going to run as an independent. And in the United States, it's never really been the case that somebody running as a third party mm -hmm. has, or an independent, has actually kind of lasted uh, very long. I think that will be true again. And really, those kind of parties, after Ross Perot ran an independent campaign back in the 90s, and then he attempted to start a third party uh, after that, and it really just fizzled out. And that's happened multiple times over the course of our history. <laughs> At the presidential uh, level, uh, election-wise, uh, third-party candidates oftentimes uh, become spoilers for uh, right. for one of the one or the other candidate on in the two dominant parties. But there's an interesting development ongoing right now uh, at the uh, in the legislature, the Congress, because 
on the Republican side, uh, through the speakerships of John Boehner and then Paul Ryan, um, we saw the emergence of a Tea Party faction, which then um, uh, transformed into the Freedom Caucus. So you had about 40 um, very arch conservative, ultra conservatives, uh, who oftentimes blocked the Republican agenda while we had the majority in the House because things weren't good enough. They wanted the unattainable. They wanted something hard right when many others didn't go along with them. And so it divided the Republican majority so that they, they didn't have a workable majority. So that division has crept in to the Republican side. And with the last election, um, a lot of the, the more centrist Republicans in the House lost. So there's more party purity now on the Republican side. Interestingly, that same type of developments now occurring on the Democratic side of the aisle where you have uh, a, a very uh, strong left progressive wing uh, by, uh, represented by uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and others. And then you have a, uh, a more traditional wing of the Democratic Party. And those differences, now that they're in the majority, are starting to emerge. Speaker Pelosi has done a wonderful job, I think, in, in holding it together to win the speakership. Uh, but now there are some divisions cropping up on procedural votes that just happened in the last week or so. She's having to deal with that. And I don't know, Donna, you may, you may have more insights into that issue, but yeah. it's, it's, we're seeing this balkanization in both parties, which effectively it sort of acts like a multi-party system. On the Republican side, when we had the majority, we often talked about how we don't have a, a unified Republican Party. We got, we got two separate parties within a party. Yeah, I, I would say that on the Democratic side, that uh, group that is w way to the left is probably significantly smaller than the um, Tea Party um, Freedom, Caucus. Freedom Caucus faction in the, um, in the Republican Party. Um, my experience in working with um, Speaker Pelosi, and I was part of her leadership team when I was in the, in the Congress, but my experience of working with her is that her style of management of the Democratic Caucus is very different from Paul Ryan or from John Boehner, where she individually meets with each of these individual groups and figures out sort of where the leverage points are. Um, within those those members, and so that's how she's been able to hold that uh, together. And I do think it poses a challenge, but I also think that there are significant numbers of people who describe themselves as the Progressive Caucus, but who also are very connected to the leadership, which is, I guess, again, a little bit different from mm -hmm. the Republican Party. Um, but it is going to be a challenge, and I, but I don't see those things emerging as official parties, even though within the two big parties, they can't operate as competing factions. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I don't think it becomes institutionalized, and I think we, we, we're, we'll have a two-party system right. for the foreseeable future. And part of that's because we have a presidential system, and it, it tends it's, to break out yeah. in, in two parties, and that sort of, you know, follows through down downstream. We're already very concerned that uh, congressional authority has been so limited that it's created an imbalance in the um, in the branches of government. That if we were to see parties emerge, that would just be another way of empowering the executive to the detriment of the legislative branch, in right. my opinion. Yeah. Commenting on what you were saying before about the styles in which politicians like to discuss their ideas, in what ways do you think uh, civilization in modern day politics has eroded? That's a loaded question. <laughs> it's a lot to it, too. Um, the biggest issue is civility. And, um, and it's, it's driven such harsh rhetoric that people uh, get entrenched and it, it becomes a zero-sum game. I think that's the problem. You know, in, in years past, in the parties, um, you had Republicans, Democrats, and there was a considerable overlap between the two 
uh, with people serving in Congress who, uh, you know, whether you had some liberal Republicans, some conservative Democrats, their views were very similar. And it, it, it created the opportunity to work together and you didn't have the other things that, that drive the vision, the money, the social media, the special interest groups out there that were empowered by social media and money and grassroots um, um, opportunities. I think all those things kind of have cons conspired to create the partisanship, the harsh rhetoric, rhetoric and the zero sum atmosphere. And I think that's where things have deteriorated. If we're going to salvage our, uh, our democratic institutions, we're going to have to reverse that trend. And um, it's not going to be easy. But it starts with having a conversation about it. And Donna and I, who both served, we've been through those fights. We did our best to counter some of the, 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 the really more uh, extreme sides of our parties, our respective parties, to find ways to work together. You know, we've ended our official political careers now. All we can do is speak out about this and encourage the next generation to take up the mantle uh, so that when you do run for a council, a, you know, council position or a parliament here in this country, um, you'll keep that in mind and recognize that when you hold public office, you have a higher obligation to not stoop to that kind of level and, uh, and not make it zero sum all the time. There are going to be differences, but there ought, to, there, ought to be, there ought to be space for people to say, okay, we can agree on these sets of issues. Let's go fix these problems. Here's where we really disagree and let the, let the ideas clash, but in a way that's respectful. That's what's missing. Yeah, and I would say there are some systemic reasons that members of Congress no longer have quite the ability to uh, communicate with each other, um, to become friendly with each other, and one of it is about structure. So, for example, it used to be the case that most members of Congress during the entire session lived in Washington. They brought their families to Washington. Their families interacted with each other. They socialized together in addition to legislating. They developed relationships that actually allowed them then to work on, on issues. Now, Members come in for three and a half, four days. They leave. There are big uh, breaks in between. And, there, and when you're in Washington, the only thing that you really have time to do is go to your committee assignments, go to Florida to vote and raise money. And so it doesn't allow for that kind of personal interaction with one another anymore. There used to be a lot more congressional travel where bipartisan groups would get together and they would travel to different countries on fact-finding missions. But a lot of the um, non-governmental groups beat them up and said, you're wasting taxpayer money. Why are you doing that? Well, one of the purposes that that kind of travel serves is so that members can understand the world together, visiting the UK together, visiting Afghanistan, Iraq together, they understand the world in a different kind of way when they do that together. That contributes to good lawmaking. It also helps people to build relationships with each other. One of the ways that I got to know the former speaker, Paul Ryan, and his wife was on a congressional delegation travel to Saudi Arabia together. And that shared experience meant that when we came back to Washington, it didn't mean that I didn't agree, I agreed with everything that he said or wanted to do, but it meant that when I was engaged in a debate or a dispute, it's really hard to beat up on somebody once you've known them, you've met them, you've shared dinner with them, and you've met their wife and children. And so I think that to the extent that we can begin to return to that kind of normal kind of activity, that it would actually contribute to the ability to work in a civil way. I had similar experiences through travel. And um, when I first uh, got on to the House Ways and Means Committee, which is a very important committee in Congress uh, that makes a lot of money decisions, uh, we were on the, in the minority. And there was someone uh, who was in Democratic leadership who also sat on the committee. He represented uh, a, a, a Los Angeles district that was he heavily Latino. Uh, I represented a Louisiana district in the South, 
more rural, very different constituencies. Uh, but I, I saw him as a very smart person, and, I, and I, I, I contacted him one day, and I said, let's go have breakfast together. And we did. And, you know, it was an interesting conversation. I, I respected him because I thought he was a really smart guy. He respected me. We said, look, we're going to disagree on a lot of things, but if I understand your district and you understand mine better, we'll, we'll know where, where each other's coming from. So we agreed to meet regularly from time to time for breakfast. And, and then we kind of expanded the group on our committee. Um, and we, we developed a little bit of a sense of collegiality that um, we sort of pledged to each other that when we have a heated debate in the committee, we won't attack each other personally. And we pretty much held to that. One time it got right to the edge and he got really testy with me, I got testy with him. And we immediately caught it, it was almost simultaneous, we caught, caught ourselves and backed off of it. And so when that debate was over with, um, uh, it was sort of a race to see who could get to the other person quickest to shake hands and, and really apologize. And we always sort of had that kind of working relationship. And, uh, but it requires you to, to, to put yourself out and to try to meet others. One other anecdote along those lines, one time we were walking back from votes and I was walking back with some Republican colleagues and somebody asked, what do you think the Democrats are going to do on this particular issue? And I had some insights into it because I'd been talking to friends who are Democrats. And, and so my colleagues said, well, how did you find that out? And I said, well, I just asked. And they said, well, who'd you ask? And I told them. And they said, they talk to you? I said, yes, we're friends. And, and these were Republicans who never took time to go, you know, get to know somebody on the other side of the aisle. And, um, but there are pressures uh, out there that prevent that. And I'll give you one last example without really belaboring this, but one time we were having a very vigorous debate on the floor of the House. I was leading uh, our effort on, on the Republican side. A uh, Democrat, uh, who was actually the chairman of the, the, the committee at the time, uh, was leading the debate. We were both scoring points in the debate, and it was a good debate. And so as soon as it was over, I, I walked over to the other side, uh, to where he was, to shake hands. This was all televised on C-SPAN, and I had constituents who saw this who were very partisan, and next thing you know, the phone's ringing constantly in the office, email starts coming in, social media, uh, just chastising me for, for speaking with the enemy and being friendly with the enemy. And I'm thinking, really? That's not the enemy. That's a fellow member of Congress who I, you know, I like, and we just happen to have different views on some things. But that's the kind of outside pressure that, that comes to bear. Well, I'm afraid to say we've run out of time, but I think that was a really uh, wonderful lesson for all of us in talking to each other and, and you know, the, the value of, of listening and, uh, and discussion, which I hope you've all enjoyed today. Um, I'm just going to say a few last words to explain that this event has been part of our Congress to Campus UK program, which is a program that brings uh, former members of Congress to the UK to meet with uh, student and general audiences um, and to, to talk about contemporary US politics. Um, and I'd really like to say a big thank you to all of our partners who, who've helped uh, make this possible. Um, the US Association of Former Members of Congress, of which both Charles and Donna are members uh, in Washington, help, um, help select uh, the members uh, to come to, to, to the UK. But in particular, our UK partner, the Rothermere American Institute at the University of Oxford, who've done the lion's share of the organizing for this week. Um, and also our supporters at the British Association for American Studies, and in particular, um, the US Embassy uh, in London, who've been really helpful in getting this session um, and this live stream off the ground. So will you all join me in thanking our guests, Donna and Charles. Thank you so Thank much. You. And thank you very much to all of you for your wonderful questions um, and to those who've been watching us online. So thank you very much.